so nice to see see Tanda. How, how are you since uh, is everything okay over there no everything is fine i don't know about yours your your side everything is fine eh yeah except oh. it was snowing in the morning but uh, it's interesting times <laughs> definitely how's it uh, murat are you well yes yes it's okay thank you very much mm. enjoying ourselves with cold weather and just waiting the uh the seasons change between us you you went to winter and we become the summer then <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely okay now uh i think that uh the guests are already coming in yes so, um uh, welcome everyone oops <laughs> sorry sorry okay is there a is there a security breach no no yeah <laughs> it's my alarm for the for that sounds first. like an alarm a hacker is on the door and if you like <laughs> okay so uh today we are going to talk about the cyber security in healthcare mm -hmm. and our guest uh tanda is with us uh, from south africa as you may imagine and murat is from istanbul so we are uh, organizing a webinar between two continents, but we want to um, talk about uh, cybersecurity, especially in healthcare. So thank you for this opportunity, Tandai. It's a pleasure. No, thank you for uh, thank you for ha ha having me as well. And uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we're going to share with everyone the uh, link afterwards. And uh, I may welcome everyone to come up with questions. So there is a uh, Q&A site and you can anytime you know, give us a question, just send from the chat and we'll be happy to answer them all. And that's a one hour uh, talk. So um, before starting, as you had uh, mentioned, I would like to start a very short um, mm -hmm. demographic um, poll, uh, which will show us, you know, what, uh, where are we coming from? And also, what role do we have in our organizations? Yeah. So let's just quickly start this poll. And I guess you'll be able to see it now. So can the participants uh, be answering them? This is an anonymous one. So it's just to see you know, uh, where are we coming from? What do we do to understand the audience so that we can try to tailor um do you see the results or only myself or everyone I, I don't see the results i don't see the results as well okay so let me just share my screen with you and here you see the results we only see the uh bug bounty bug logo bounty. Arif. okay so you don't see the results this way okay I just stop it. So what I can see is um, the 50% um, of the participants are coming from South Africa and the other 50%, uh, 36% is coming from Turkey and some from Europe. So this is a mixed group. And what I see from the uh, people's roles in their organizations, Tandai, you were asking about this is uh, a few people are from IT management area, uh, like CIO, CTO, CISO level, and three people are uh, coming from solution partner advisory consultancy companies, and two of them are company owners, founders, or investors, and four are others. So no doctors or healthcare professional with us today. <laughs> That's very bad. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is how the group is. So let's start the chat. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. So um, let me just start by asking, uh, for example, um, what do you observe uh, as the digital transformation change in South Africa, Tanda? You know, how uh, quick it is, how much does it affect the, the business that's been going on in healthcare, and what are the uh, consequences of the fast digital transformation in case of cyber attacks, hacking uh, problems, or the other risks involved? Yeah, you know, that's a very mouthful 
question. Uh, that's a very- We can talk for two days. Question. Yeah, we can talk for two days. But to answer your question, because of COVID-19, uh, we all know that it made uh, digitization very possible. So in the health sector, we, we started seeing that the, the, the old way of walking into a be it a, a hospital or a, when, you, when you've got your, sorry, just need to, to close this. When you've got, uh, if you're feeling sick, be it your, your dentist, where you want to go to a dentist, where you're feeling your headache, we found out that now there's a new way of uh, addressing that, which is telemedicine. So to answer your question, that is actually happening in South Africa and it's going fast. So what we mean by telemedicine and when we say telemedicine, it's digital health. So it happens in, in two ways. Whereas the patient now no longer has to go inside the hospital, he can only he can book online in a, a appointment, have a face-to-face -face, uh, video call with his doctor or her doctor, then they can get the prescription. So that's one way of looking at it, which is digital health. Mm -hmm. Then now we've got the other side where there's the doctors, there's the nurse, there's a specialist, where now they were now where now they are saying, okay, because of uh, COVID, the results which are usually needed, I would walk into the hospital, I would walk into the theater, I would look at those results in a paper form. Now I want to access those results via my iPad, be it my phone, be it my, my PC in my office, and most of all when I'm at home so that I can actually go through the results. Yeah. All of this is brought digital health and it's it's going fast the consequences of that now is that we're seeing now the it management your cios your CISOs, and everything they're now playing a catch up because when we 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 are now digitizing healthcare medical devices we're now digitizing face to face where we eliminating walk in now comes the question of privacy consent when i was a patient if i'm a patient the old way was that i walk in i sign off all the papers i give the consent i tick i tick i tick uh the nurse who, the, who takes it everything stores it in a nice file up somewhere and she can always go there and retrieve it now this is now happening electronically you now need to tick the box and now we're starting to identify that when you tick that consent box the IT guy or the, the, the infrastructure team now needs to keep track of such things. And now it's, a, it's it now becomes a functional requirement, which is, uh, which is meant to address uh, patient consent. And the guys from privacy or the guys from the compliance would want to see that. And now we're starting to see the, the, the effect of trying to store such. We're, trying to, we're now seeing uh, the effect of programming such a simple task, which in the old way was just simple. You could, pu you could put all of your consent on a paper and you could put it away, but now it has to be stored on electronic format. Okay, so let me just, I think it was a very nice entrance and uh, maybe in order to have a short comparison between South Africa, what you had explained us and between what's happening in Turkey, I may relate a similar question to Murat. Murat, what do you observe um, in healthcare industry? What's the really the big impact of digital transformation? Um, if you know there are things that you may agree with, uh, Tandai, or things that you may maybe want to add on them. Sure. Uh, thanks, Arif. Uh, well, uh, before going into specific the Turkish market, uh, I mean digital transformation is basically transforming an organization. Uh, into digital, right? So um, in terms of the tra transformation is always, we look for some innovations, some changes. And um, do we need cybersecurity in innovations? Do we need cybersecurity in digital transformation? Uh, the answer is no. If your innovation doesn't be successful, if nobody is using it, if it doesn't create any power, it doesn't create any health, if it doesn't create any money, nobody would care. But if the transformation would become successful, uh, then as we know, and uh, the crime always follows the power, the money. So um, 
and then of course um, it is very important to uh, do the cybersecurity preventions because uh, unfortunately and of course also fortunately the healthcare industry um, I don't see uh, the digital transformation in healthcare industry in another in one specific project. It's been going for ages, and now it's actually with an increase uh, acceleration, uh, increased speed. The transformation of every bits and pieces in healthcare has been going on. For example, I mean, if if I would start talking about. Um, uh, infusion pumps, for example, for insulin. And then if I've talked about some pacemakers with your heart, I mean, they are on the market for tens of years, right? But nowadays, the newer versions has some very good capabilities. Whenever you move into the hospital, uh, your pacemaker, for example, or your infusion pump would start connecting with the hospital, download the latest data, uh, and then, or so, sorry, upload the latest data to uh, the hospital so that whenever you see your doctor, the doctor is not only see you, but also see your uh, immediate past, what was happening while you were not around, right? Mm -hmm. That connectivity uh, is part of the digital transformation or the digital innovation towards healthcare industry. And that creates a new, um, new fronts for hackers to hack, which can not only deal with your money or your power, it can also deal with your life at the end of the day. Um, I can see and I can relate to today in South Africa that we also have uh, some new privacy laws in place. And those privacy laws are, of course, taking care of all private information, but healthcare information uh, in Turkey is in another level. Uh, they, they do request uh, some additional uh, encryption and additional protection, and there are some fines against that. So let me put a comma here, and I will talk more on the next round, okay? <laughs> So, uh, for example, what we call as uh, KVKK, KVKK in Turkey, mm -hmm. the equivalent in South Africa is called uh, Popaye. Popaye. Yes. Yes. Popaye. Yeah, Popaye. Yeah. Okay. So we were discussing about you know what would be the largest fines of each. So we were trying to compare them between two countries, and we come up that South Africa is in a better position than in Turkey. Right? <laughs> yes. Uh, because you know, um, approximately uh, when we cal calculate, I mean, uh, calculating the amount of money, even if we do have the exchange rate, is not an easy way to understand. Because sometimes the company's uh, position of getting uh, that the, the buying power of uh, buying power of the same money could be different. With papaya, if I my uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, it was close to 3,000 uh, or, or, yeah, was it 3,000? Yeah, probably yeah. 3,000 man days, uh, equivalent of, for example, an average pen testing assignment would be the highest level of fines in papaya. In, our, in Turkish version or in, in, in Turkish version, the highest is approximately 1,000 man days. And in, in GDPR, in the Europeans in general, general protection directive, um, in GDPR, there is no such limit. The limit is your overall turnaround of the previous year up to some percentage of it. That's why there's like billions of dollars of worth of fining. For example, I remember two years ago, there was a big breach in one of the uh, medical testing centers in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, millions of data was breached. And their fine, uh, their lawsuits was around one and a half billion dollars altogether. I don't know how much they got fined, but uh, what was the top limit uh, in South Africa, Tanday? Uh, it's 10 million rands, which is equivalent to almost 650,000 US dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. it's good. Um, Murat mentioned that where there's no money, there's no in innovation. So yes. in the health sector for the CISOs, the CIOs, the CTO, the, the challenge which we, we always have, uh, the cha challenge which they always face or the question they always ask me with my peers is that, how do you talk risk 
to a, a doctor? How do you talk risk to a nurse? How do you talk risk to a, a specialist? <laughs> so let me give you one example in radiology. Here in South Africa, or oh, the business model for radiology is that they get money by their referrals. So if I refer a radiology, if I refer a patient to a, a radiology, that's how we get them, them uh, his cash. Previously, you'd go into the radiology, have an x-ray, print out this massive A3 thing and say, okay, we're gonna send it to your doctor. You'll see the results in a day or two. Mm -hmm. But now because of digitization, uh, the radiology now can use that equipment to go over the internet and give a click for the doctor to uh, see the results. Meaning that the, the sooner the doctor gets the results, the sooner uh, he can give his uh, opinion or he can treat the patient. Now, this, is, this becomes a bit challenging in the sense that initially when we bought that uh, X-ray ma machine, when we on bought it, when we, when we, we bought that machine, Cyber security controls were not taken into consideration. What do I mean by that? An X-ray machine consists of a, a PC, which uh, has an operating system, which can be XP, Windows 7, or wi Windows 10. The ones I'm speaking about right now, they actually are in existence. So now you're finding a, a situation where you, you still have a, a Windows XP, and now you want to go digital, and your IT guys are saying, no, you can't do that. But now, the financial manager or the specialist who's responsible for that is saying, but no, I can still use it because the rate of return or the rate of investment which was put in that X-ray is more than the life support of an operating system. Windows XP now, it's no more supported. That means it's been discontinued, but however, the X-ray machine still works. So already now we started that, how do they appreciate that risk? How do they say, okay, fine, explain to us in, 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 a, in, in a way that we understand. The first thing is that you want to go digital, your digitizing strategy, simply by saying you want to allow people to access the X-ray over the internet. Mm -hmm. If we do that, there's ransomware. You need to now start to, to unpack it in a way that they, 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 they understand. And that's one of the challenges which we face. And that's one of the biggest concern in, in the healthcare because we still have medical devices that, that are still running on all an unsupported operating uh, system. The lifespan of them will always outlive the operating system. The cost of replacing them just because I want to go over the, the internet, or I need to do digitization can be six, million equivalent to USD and having a conversation at the CIO, the CTO to have a conversation with the doctor or an MD around that, it's it's a challenge. I don't know about your side, um, Murat. Uh, yes, um, I mean, I agree completely. So I'm not going to add to that part, but I'm going to uh, add to something else that I, to your what you just described. Um, so if you are talking about um, Healthcare industry, healthcare industry, like any other industry, there are some suppliers like the X-ray machine producers and sellers, like you just defined. And of course, there are the um, healthcare providers to the public, like hospitals, for example. So when, when, when you go to the hospital, when you talk to um, a managing doctor or an IT guy within the hospital, well, of course, they are not an expert on IT security. I mean, you, sh you shouldn't expect that on that side, right? So what they do is they, of course, go and ask the first person who believe that they know about security. So they would basically go and ask the X-ray uh, uh, machine provider saying that, are you okay with security of it? We, we hear that there are some cyber security issues in healthcare in hospitals, and we'd like to be sure that. Unfortunately, and this is, uh, this is also the case in Turkey, in Europe as well, most of the uh, device manufacturers have not a clear understanding of the cybersecurity on their own. 
uh, they basically say, oh, okay, yes, there are some cybersecurity issues. If you basically get, a, get your X-ray machine behind a firewall, you are safe. But and technically, this is not the case, as we all know. I mean, uh, as you were mentioning, if the operating system is so old, if the if that machine needs to be connected uh, through some other devices to another uh, provider, to an hospital, to an imaging center, that firewall is not capable of protecting the device on its own. There is very easily have some backdoors, some other loopholes that can be hacked. And hacking a device doesn't necessarily mean that the personal information is stolen. That's only one side of the story. The other side of the story, um, it, it can also be uh, it, it prevented the device to, to, from working. I mean, that would be an emergency. That could be an emergency imaging. And at that moment, if there is a cyber attack, the, uh, the system can be uh, basically stopped. For example, last year in Germany, there was a very uh, important cyber attack towards a hospital. And because of the hospital, uh, people in the intensive care unit, because the devices stopped working, uh, literally doctors and the uh, helpers they pushed the, uh, the hospital beds across the corridors, across the street, to the hospital across the street. And they were trying to uh, save the intensive care patients. I mean, normal patients, they could walk, normal patients can wait, but in intensive care, because you need devices even to breathe, right? And those devices were stopped working. So unfortunately, uh, there was one patient died, or actually I should say killed because of that uh, cyber attack. Um, what I see here from both of you that's, that's uh, sharing, there is like a compromise, isn't it, uh, Tandai? Because, for example, uh, sometimes the hospitals have to go through a lot of new investments in new technology in order to be more secure with uh, cyber security. Or on the other hand, they can continue with the old systems. So there, isn't there some kind of uh, compromise here? Because you know you may accept some of the security breaches, but continue working. But does it really worth doing this? Because when uh, I was just sharing a, a, a graph uh, just a few minutes ago, it, it's showing that on the top of the list, the average total cost of a data breach by industry, healthcare is number one. So this is even more than the financial services industry. This is the surprising part of it. Yeah, I can't say compromise pay exactly because when I when I speak with my seniors or the people I report into, they always say the first thing they always ask is, don't tell me the problem, tell me the solution. And when you go to the, 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 the nurses that use the medical devices or, or the MD or the specialist, you look at you and say, speak nurse, speak something I can, un, I can understand. So one of the solutions to that, which is not a compromise, is that walk the journey of how do we onboard a medical device? How do we buy that medical device? device then in in-house meaning the hospital itself you now need to start putting uh cyber security hide this medical device for us the most important thing that is you need to be able to give us updates you now need to harden your medical device so that when it joins our our network as it we cannot touch that medical device because it's property software the other thing is as well to say fine in the event of a, 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 a in, in an event of an, a vulnerability being identified for instance one of the best one i can think of is the log 4j which happened in december how quickly will you react to it because the nurses have, have literally told me that the minute you come to me and say we are having a cyber security threat on a certain medical device. We are going to switch it off because for us, patient care is more important. Saving human life is more important, right? Then when you make that call, obviously that's going to affect now cash flow, revenue, like what Murad said, that you can, wherever there's 
uh, digitization they should be earning. So now you, you, you're finding yourself that you now need to bridge the gap uh, with the people who use the devices in, in everyday security controls. And actually being on the seat when they actually onboard a medical device or when a supplier comes and is selling a certain medical device, we're now empowering the nurses who didn't even know about cybersecurity controls. We're starting to bridge that gap and say, prompt these questions, ask this and this and that. Uh, I would like to ask a question to Tandaya, if it's okay. Yeah. Uh, there, yeah. there is just yeah. a comment from uh, one yes, of our... You can... Uh, th there was a good comment from one of the participants, Murat. May I just add this and then get your question? Sure. Because Justin was saying yeah. South Africa does not take se uh, security yeah. seriously, unfortunately. So there is the human side of it. Mm -hmm. so whatever we do with the technology, at the end of the day, it's the human who is going to apply it and use it. So he says, for example, even on a daily basis, people refuse to use 2FA. Uh, so you were mentioning about uh, you know emergency rooms. I will get to that uh, Tandai that people using you know the same username, same password for everyone, and uh, this is uh, beyond the technology. It's just about the human, you know how we uh, behave. So uh, if uh, he he was mentioning even if you know we would take an hour or something uh, per day or per week even to understand you know how we can improve our awareness uh, with the security. Uh, I think it will become a better uh, position in terms of security by, for everyone or the organization itself. So what would you like to say for that? Yeah, I, I, exactly. Thank you, Justin, for your comments. And I, I do believe, and I was going to say something similar. Let me just give an example, give another example of, of what you have just said. Um, in, for example, Turkey, uh, there are some information only doctors are allowed to see, uh, not the nurses, not everybody else. Of course, the, the, own, the patient, of course, the owner of the data can see everything to, to, for him or her, but the doctor could see. But, uh, but because of the IT and because doctors doesn't care about security much, uh, sometimes they share their username and password. Uh, and if 2FA, two-factor authentication is not enforced, uh, of course, nurses can easily now see all the details of all the patients. And even if sometimes the two-factor authentication is enforced from, for example, using short messages from mobile phones, doctors even, uh, whenever there is, a, uh, there is this four or six digit code for the 2FA, they simply tell that code uh, to their nurses, to their helpers, so that they do that. And doctors also have their, the thing is that doctors always say that, okay, I am here to care of the patients. I, I don't have time. I don't have uh, the, the, the capability to uh, use the computer. So let the nurses or the helpers use the computer and I do care with the patients. I understand to a certain extent, of course, the doctors, the main responsibility is to cure, to, to care of their patients. But if there is a decision saying that this information should only be seen by the doctors, then the overall healthcare industry, including the regulations, should be sure that the doctors have the capability and devices, of course, so that they can, they can use the computer. So we need some sort of training as well, in addition to very important awareness training as well. Thanks. I just want to comment on what Justin uh, said. South Africa does not take security seriously, and, and unfortunately. So one of the first thing I did when I was doing medical device cyber security was uh, a tour into the hospital. Uh, the hospital included all of the practices, meaning that uh, if you've got an accident, you call the emergency uh, transport. The first point is ICU. And in the ICU, you see a lot of things. Your someone has uh, got a gunshot. Uh, you see a lot of blood, right? Then from the emergency room, you go seven, you go to your theater. So I was put in a, a 
position where I saw a doctor wants to use a medical device to save life. If he forgets for two seconds his pin because he's under pressure, if he forgets, that means malpractice or that means that person is going to die. So it's not that they don't take it seriously, it's that the nature of, of the job, saving life is more important for them. Mm -hmm. And now, if you, if you try to take a step back, when they were trained, they were trained to use medical devices they were, that were mechanically driven. Now, when you take a, a look back, most of the devices that come now are software driven. So the culture has to change. So we always uh, joke around to say, we've got the iPad generation in the non-iPad generation so that they don't take it seriously. Is that when you go through the whole process, you, you start to understand to say, if he forgets one thing because he's got blood on his hands and now he has to remember his password and all of those things, that's number one. The second thing is that maybe in Turkey or wherever, uh, I, I'm not sure, but doctors don't have the privilege to be assigned their own medical devices like a laptop. We all use one medical device to carry out so many things. So even if you see in the in, in medical TV series when they're conducting an MR, for, for instance, you always see so many doctors, but they're still using the single machine. So if they forget, the normal way in the IT is that you forget your password, it locks you out, you call your help desk or you, you prompt and then boom, it's, it's, it's opened again. So imagine you're in that MRI scan or somewhere, somehow the doctor forgets or the, uh, the nurse forgets the password. What's going to happen? What would you take more seriously, security or saving life? What Justin commented in the financial industry, that can be true. But in the health industry, you oh, it's not a compromise, but you have to be holistic and say, if I'm put in the same situation to save a life, and if I forget my, my password, I mean, all of us, when we go for uh, Ramadan holiday or Christmas holiday, when we're when we back, we forget our password, then boom, we, we are locked. If you're fortunate enough, you can call your IT help desk. What is for the medical devices, IT help desk is not involved. It's actually the vendor. Mm -hmm. So now you have to consider the time. Say, if I lock myself inside, how long will it take the vendor to come in and say, okay, fine, here's a new uh, password. Now you can go inside. So in the medical space, whilst we talk about, if we talk about security, we talk about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In the medical uh, space is the other way around. It's availability, which is the safety of that and availability of that device. Then comes confidentiality. Then the last one is integrity. So I pose the, the question again to Justin and say, if you're a doctor, are you willing to forget a password and risk uh, a patient's life? That's all, thank you. Um, thank you, Tadai. Um, though integrity, I mean, uh, I would also suggest you think of integrity uh, also uh, how well the device is working, because if uh, the device parameters are changed, if the device configuration is used, maybe the device seems to be working, but what you get uh, out of that a device. It could be an image, it could be a result of an MRI, it could be a result of your um, EG, EGK, uh, ECG, or in your brain, EEG. If the device configuration is changed, that is the integration of the device, mm -hmm. uh, the results might be uh, misleading to the doctors and, and that would lead to uh, a damage towards the patient as well. So that's also quite important. Yeah, just, just, just to add on to what you just said. So previously, the integrity part would, would always find that the medical devices were always in their own secluded network, far from anyone. No one comes in and touches them. They always stand there for 10 years. But because of digitization now, it's starting to ca come up. We now need to talk about hardening that device. We now need to talk about 
uh, safe protocols that will transfer uh, information not in clear text. So in the medical space, there's this one I actually had to learn, HL7 protocol. You now have to encrypt that. Whereas in the IT, you can always say when we do an application, make sure TLS is, is, is enabled and, and all of those things. So now the integrity of it, it's now being tested because initially when that device, the ECG for measuring your, 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 your heart, when it was sold to the clinician or to the specialist, it wasn't showcased in a way that it's configured to resist the internet or to resist any malware. So now you're starting to realize that, okay, fine, I've got this. If I put my antivirus on this, what's going to happen? Goes back to your integrity. Will, will the machine shut down? Because it was instructed only to receive one application, meaning that use this application. Now you're putting on an antivirus, you're putting on cyber reason, intelligent threat tools. How is it supposed to, to act now? So you are right, integrity is important as well. And if you consider the risks, uh, the risks are not only from outside, isn't it? So, you know, the outside risk is, okay, the hacker attacks maybe, but there is also the inside risk. For example, what about a misbehaving employee? Like, you know, somebody is angry with the organization and uh, they're trying to harm the organization from inside. So we usually don't, we do not want to consider this option. But we know that a major percentage of most of the cyber breaches are coming from inside the organizations, isn't it, Murat? You know very well from many companies you give support to. Uh, yes, of course, it is yeah, uh, quite quite right. Um, uh, I mean, that's, of course, in general. And if there is, of course, money is uh, in place, uh, the insider threat is always quite a big portion of it. Uh, but I do want to personally believe that in healthcare industry, the majority of people inside are actually focused on the human health, not with the uh, cybersecurity or hacking. Unfortunately, though, uh, statistics doesn't tell this way. I mean, uh, by the way, the insider threat is uh, is not only, of course, the, the, the healthcare providers, also the overall structure, I mean, uh, the healthcare, when you think about that, Arif, is a very large industry. I mean, coming all the way from healthcare insurance to maybe to pills, to devices that we are just talking, the centers, hospitals, and also if we are talking about personalized healthcare devices, like, uh, you know, for example, uh, the pacemakers, it's also something comes to uh, the personal ones. And uh, yes, go ahead, Feder. So the inside of threat is actually real. So one of, like uh, Murad said, it's, it's a vast uh, healthcare system. So within the hospital, there's what we call theater, where you've got your camera stakes. Your camera stakes, if you watch TV, usually when a doctor is busy operating, there's that camera where they put inside mm -hmm. or inside your knee just to check all, all of those things, what's happening. That is a push and pull. It's not connected to the LAN. And that video you see, it's stored on that push and pull. And how the doctor can get that information, it's via either USB or a CD-ROM. Now, when it comes to litigation now, you'd find that someone might want to get that information not the right way. So inside a threat is actually real because one can actually take uh, that uh, those images or what we call those camera video of, of a patient and they can give it to the lawyers when there's litigation involved or even if you want to be spiteful when you know that there's litigation involved you you are required to say you always need to retain patient data one can easily go and erase it mm -hmm. so the controls the cyber controls to uh, controls now start to come into play from a people uh, perspective, like what you said, user awareness, because the norm is, or the culture is, you know, hospital, everyone has to save life. But if there's a rent to it, a rent value, or a US dollar to, to say, you know, can you get me this? I'll pay you this, it becomes real. Um, and also, uh, while we were discussing this, one of the participants, Milbo, uh, Milbo 
was mentioning that you know 2FA is not the only way to of course secure the systems but also you know how we can harden the entire infrastructure uh, how we can protect our devices with other uh, ways and also uh, I will come to that point what can we do in, to understand the vulnerabilities of the systems or you know how easy is it uh, to hack the system so who can check this how can it be audited you know what would be the most clever ways to do that uh, just before going into that subject i have a short poll again uh, so let me just um, get that one that's related to cyber security i have three questions so one of them is you know have you noticed the hacking in your company and uh, how often do you get security of your systems checked and so on so let me just start this is it also an anonymous poll yes. or do you receive names as well? No, no, no names. It's anonymous. So you can be sincere with this. So please say yes if you have noticed the hacking in your company. And we won't know who has given that answer. Can I, can I answer that? Uh, question yeah, whilst you wait for the poll or what? Sure. Uh, so you've mentioned about uh, vulnerability management around uh, medical health devices. So let me take a step back. In IT, it's a bit easy because you've got your tools that can scan, your Nessus, your Rapid7, you scan, you identify a vulnerability, you confirm if it's a false positive, it's a patch, you easily Patch, boom, it goes through the change uh, management process. We are happy. Medical devices are very tricky. Like I said initially, they were when they were so when you when, when you showcase a medical uh, device, it, it, it's always in three modes. There's the patient mode when it's actually being used, then there's a demo mode where it's actually being uh, demoed. Then there's a servicing um, mode when it goes offsite by the third vendor and they fix all of those things. So the service mode would fall under your patch. So you're now put in a position where you now need to have a vulnerability program where you don't have a tool that will scan that medical device. Now you're now reliant on the vendor. However, for medical device, there's a, a website called ICRI, E-C-R-I, it's called ICRI. It sends out alerts to say, if you've got this medical device, there's a cybersecurity uh, threat around it, there's this vulnerability. Two years back or three years back, ICRI did never, hardly sent those cybersecurity alerts. Back to what uh, Murat said to say, now because of digitization, these medical devices are now being upgraded so that they can connect over the internet. So you'd find that it can send out uh, an alert. The question now is who does that alert go to? Have we established a vulnerability management end-to-end -end process like the one for IT? Yes, we can leverage off from IT, but IT now is so mature in their vulnerability that they've put what they would call, if you're an IT auditor, your general uh, controls, that's your change management process, where you actually have to test and provide results that, that it's working. And if it fails, you roll back. So for medical devices, it has to work. You can't roll back. Mm -hmm. And the question is that, who do you allocate that responsibility to? When we got that um, medical device back to what, Murat said that vendors themselves don't know their role, what role to play. And it's not only not, it's only not that they don't know their role, what role to play. You have to integrate the process in-house with the vendor. You can't allow a vendor to dictate to you. So if you've got a patch uh, to say we, we fix patches in two or three, two days or three days, it has to stick. It has to filter back to vendor as well. Mm -hmm. So that's how you can manage the, uh, the, the, the vulnerability around the medical devices. You have to establish a vulnerability management process. 
that includes the vendor, that includes responsibility and accountability. That's all I can say. Okay. So uh, I will just give a voice to Murat, but just before that, let me just share with you the results of this short poll. So I think you have, you see it now. So, I don't. You don't? No, uh, maybe the parties or the, or the speakers cannot. If you could please quick summarize here. Okay, so 25% um, of the participants said uh, we mm -hmm. noticed the hacking, while 75% said we didn't notice the hacking. Uh, so if you mm -hmm. didn't notice, is that a good news, bad news? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we know that, you know, uh, usually it takes six months for an organization to notice that there's a cyber breach. So maybe the hacker is in the system, but we are not aware of that. I, I hope this is not the case for the other ones. And the second question was, how often is the security of your uh, systems audited or checked? And 30% says once a year, which is like a normal uh, response that we would see in our countries as well. Uh, and 13% uh, says whenever a new technology is added. So this is uh, good. And even better response, which is over 50% is continuously. So I'm really happy to see these results. It's very satisfactory. And uh, about the reasons, the main reasons for being hacked is like 40-50% uh, is divided between technology and digital, digital transformation. So fast pace change is really one of the major uh, reasons behind. But there is also the human uh, side, which is even more than that. So human errors are really the number one. And a small portion is processes. But nobody voted anything about management. So <laughs> managers are safe here. <laughs> so, nice. The, the, the decision makers have no, uh, <laughs> they doesn't have any bits in any of these uh, results. Uh, so, I just, yeah, go ahead. I just want to comment on the number two question on auditing. Mm -hmm. So there's always an interesting question I always get from my, my, my friends as well, and also from the CIOs and everyone else to say, you want us to audit security medical devices. If you have a finding, who's gonna fix it? Who are you going to allocate that finding to? So you'd find in the medical space, auditing medical devices, it's not as, uh, in, in, in IT. So if an IT auditor or a security auditor, you always have a tool, be it your CSS uh, benchmark, your Nessus, you just put the tool on the network, you scan, you find your results, you substantiate or not, you send the results to either your CIO, your CISO, or the infrastructure guys, they fix all of those things. The hardest part with medical devices is that you cannot afford to scan them because they, we don't know how it will react. Mm -hmm. Half of the time when it, it doesn't understand, it's a fail safe, it will stop. And <laughs> if it's giving patient care, it's now a, a challenge. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, people in the, in the finance space would, would, would understand to say when they do their vulnerability assessment or even their, their uh, audits, they do it after hours, eight o'clock, nine, when everything is just come down, the branches are not opened, you can afford to do a vulnerability assessment. You can afford to do your, when you have your security checklist, you can afford to um, remediate those findings. But in the health sector, it's, it's hard yeah. because 24 seven, the medical devices are working. Yeah. Another thing is you cannot just disable every USB because even the vendors themselves, they've got a special key, which is a USB where they need to put inside to come into a maintenance uh, check on site as well. So that's the challenge which we have when it comes to security of medical devices. It's hard to, to do an audit on them because you have to explain to the CIO or the CISO to say, okay, this is the risk. He understands it. Yes, uh, the, the HL7 is transferring clear text. He understands it because he also understands it from an IT perspective. But now you have to tell the specialist, the doctor to say, this is a risk. And you ask you, how much will it cost me to fix it? And is it 
was it calculated when I bought this device half of the time? It's no. So now it's okay. You have the finding. It's there. I can't do anything around it. Um, so is there a way to manage a, an ongoing uh, protection? So we, what I understand from your perspective, this is not possible in healthcare. So we can only manage, you know, uh, timely checks. And that has to be at a time where the hospital is not very busy, although it's you know usually busy 24 by 7. So what is your experience behind this, Murat? What do you reckon? Uh, yeah, I will I will come back to that, Arif, but uh, let me emphasize something else. I mean, in the old days, when we talk about healthcare industry and technology, we were mostly talking about uh, the uh, healthcare devices. It could be the devices for imaging, it could be some technology to produce drugs, things like that. But nowadays, when we talk about healthcare industry, the healthcare industry are now much larger than only the medical devices. We do have insurance, we do have hospital management, we do have labs uh, basically um, post uh, sending out their results uh, to clients, either to either patients or the doctors uh, through online methods. There are some mobile applications for healthcare coming up very rapidly. Uh, even within with COVID-19, each and every country more or less created at least one app to track who had COVID-19, who, who was actually being contacted with, what are going on. Also with the vaccination and everything, right? So, um, Actually, IT within healthcare uh, is growing very rapidly, and we can treat that as IT as well. Uh, when I come back to the, uh, the medical devices, uh, I do agree that those medical devices are required to work uh, 7 by 24 by 365. Even if, for example, we are talking about some devices that help us to produce cars, for example. Uh, the car factories are stopped uh, for summer holidays, for example, one month each year. And if there are some major things that should be performed, either changes or checks or whatever, you can perform those uh, in, in those stop periods. But there are uh, almost no stop periods in healthcare industry. So uh, there is not going to be a single stop period for that or the low time for period. But what they do, as uh, Tande was mentioning, there are some service periods. It's not generic to the industry. It's not generic to hospitals. It's only specific to a device. That device, whenever there is this upgrade, whenever, whenever there is a planned maintenance, that time should also be used for uh, security checks and for upgrades as well because that time is also when the vendor is also uh, on premises so they can if necessary of course fix whatever is broken to, uh, uh, during the test okay. so may i just share my screen and show a, a very reasonable way of assessing risks in a minute so no, sure. I, will, I will just show a new methodology, um, just two pages that I'm going to share with you. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, here we know that every company has a weakness against cyber attacks because of the unknown vulnerabilities. So we discussed many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we take a look at the major uh, reasons for them, the first one is we discussed already, you know, the healthcare industry is rapidly deploying software, hardware, medical devices, uh, and uh, going really digital. But in the meantime, the malicious hackers are constantly attacking those digital assets uh, well every 39 seconds. So this is the industry average. And uh, the security teams or the IT teams are usually insufficient uh, with their skill sets and mostly the number of people. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the rising cybersecurity costs are also a real problem for the IT budgets and for the, for the healthcare. And as a result of a security breach, as you see, millions of dollars of worth of personal data or other harm is giving to the organizations. 
and this is losing uh, this is causing uh, loss of cache data reliability and also sometimes client and this is a big risk for many organizations so uh, what we really propose is that uh, the, the security test services can be given by thousands of uh, freelance security experts which are gathered together in a platform service so this is the new uh, model that's increasing like a shared economy so the world realized that it really needs a large crowd to fight against an organized hacker crime and uh, in a platform like this there is like three stakeholders on one side there are the healthcare organizations and on the other side there are the security experts the, we call them researchers and on the other side there is the uh, report validators so in this methodology you know the companies are publishing their digital assets that they want to get tested on our platform on a platform like this and so that they select a security expert group to work with and the, when a vulnerability is uh, discovered by any of these uh, platform numbers the report is sent by them and it's been validated by the platform and only for the confirmed reports it becomes eligible for payment this means that the company is not giving away for a lot of money just for checking, but only giving away for a money which is like a, a valid vulnerability. So, for example, we have seen that we were able to deliver the first security bug reports within the first 24 hours. So it's such a uh, quick and uh, cost efficient way of finding most of the vulnerabilities, I may say. And this is becoming the new norm in industry so i this is why i just wanted to share with you you know what would be a smart way of finding the security bugs very quickly so this is just another way of you know next to the pen test or other security services consultancy and the uh, audits etc that you do so may i get um, last sentences by both of you what would you recommend to our uh, audience the guests as a, you know, uh, take this to your pocket while you are leaving. Sandai, would you like to start? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear the question. What, what, uh, what? The, the question is uh, the last sentence for the closure, last, last, um, last suggestion, a very short last suggestion for the audience. What would be our guest takeaway? You know, what would be your last comments or last bits? Because now the time has been uh, over one, almost one hour. So just wrap it up. <laughs> in short, you need to be able to be in a position to translate risk where a doctor can understand, a nurse can understand. And the most important thing is your governance around medical devices. It all, always starts from your SLA, your master service agreement or your contract with which you have. Then it filters into the production in, in via environment where you now have to have your technology in place, your process and your people in, in place. We can talk about cybersecurity and say technical tools, but if you're speaking to a specialist, you'll never understand. And yes, you'll never understand. Walk into a room, Make your CIO proud or your CISO proud when you explain risk that he can take to the board and say, guys, this is the risk. I need money to address this. Mm -hmm. That's what I can say. Yeah. Wonderful. Emrat? Uh, yes, more or less the same. Let me tell something else, not to repeat myself. Managing risks are very important. Uh, to be able to manage the risks, uh, there are two things there you can either go and look for the risks and try to mitigate them afterwards or you try to get um i mean risk consists of in cybersecurity risk consists of threats and vulnerabilities so most of the people when they think about the risks they think of the threats that's very important but you can also get the risks when you learn about your vulnerabilities as well so that would be my last sentence Arif. thank you okay so what I would uh, really wish for you is a hack-free year <laughs> and a lot of success in your jobs. So I hope that we never hear your bad stories and only good stories. <laughs> Thank you so yes. much. Eh? A good suggestion. Thank you.
Bye bye. Thank you so much for your attendance. Uh, thank, thank you, Tanda. Thank you, Murat. And thank you, thank everyone. You. So, I hope to see you next time in our next event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.